our uh, second to last event for this June season. We will be back in September with many more events, but I'm sad to say this is our second to last event. I thank you all for coming out on uh, a very nice evening that probably some people are sneaking away and getting into Central Park and going for a walk, but I'm glad you're here for Mr. Reynolds' presentation. This is uh, both a talk and a book signing. Our friends from the corner bookstore are here outside in the Blue Soap Gallery and they're happy to sell you a copy of the hardback or the paperback, which I believe is actually in the stores next Tuesday. So tonight you can actually get the paperback a little early. The book was published in 2011, Mightier Than the Sword, Uncle Tom's Cabin and the Battle for America. And it was published that year to celebrate the 200th anniversary of Harriet Beecher Stowe's birth. And as I said, it was, it's coming out in paper round shortly. Before we begin, if you do have a cell phone or a pager, if you don't mind just taking it out and uh, turning it off, that would be wonderful both for uh, folks here and for our event recording. We do record our events here at the Society Library and uh, we put them up on YouTube for the benefit of others. This is the time of the year when I do need to thank our friends here in the library for your support at the Spring Appeal which uh, this year has garnered a nice, tidy sum to support our general library operations and this year the Children's Library. And believe me when I say that it is really important to have your support to continue great programs like the one tonight and our reading groups that have been uh, wildly popular uh, this spring or uh, this term, our groups on Milton, Edith Wharton, and Trollope in our crime fiction series as well. And of course, our book collection, which grows, as you can see tonight, I actually brought out books related to our event this evening, and it gave me pause to think that the library, um, having been around for 258 years, we were one of the original uh, libraries in the city uh, collecting Harriet Beecher Stowe as the books were being published, and we have many uh, fine early editions. Tonight, our speaker, Dr. Reynolds, will provide us some thoughts on one of the world's most important works of fiction, Uncle Tom's Cabin, originally published back in 1852. He will explain the importance of Stowe's work in the making of America. He holds a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and is a distinguished professor of English and American Studies, Graduate Center City University of New York. He's the author of uh, many fine volumes, including Waking Giant, America in the Age of Jackson, John Brown, Abolitionist, The Man Who Sparked the Civil War, Killed Slavery, and Seated Civil Rights, and Walt Whitman's America, which won the Bancroft Prize. He is certainly one of the country's leading literary critics, biographers, and historians, and it's a real pleasure to have him with us tonight. One thing I was reflecting on today uh, was that uh, Dr. Reynolds has recently been in Salem at the Salem Athenaeum, one of our sister libraries in the membership library circle. And uh, in late 2011, he spoke at the Library Company of Philadelphia, which was founded in 1731 by Benjamin Franklin and is the, the mother of the subscription libraries or membership libraries. And he gave the keynote lecture uh, at an event there. So let me sit down and let, me, let the man who you're here to uh, hear speak come to the podium. Please welcome David S. Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, it's just great to be at New York Society Library. Uh, I'm here to talk about Harry Beecher Stowe's massively best-selling novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin which is perhaps the most influential novel ever written by an American, and it yielded the most popular and longest running play in American history. The novel appeared in 1852, nine years before the outbreak of the Civil War, and it created such a stir with this powerful anti-slavery message that Lincoln reportedly called Stowe the little lady who made this great war. It's, uh, we don't know for sure if he said that. She did meet him in November 1862, uh, to try to persuade him to sign the Emancipation Proclamation, which he was, was going to do anyway this time. And, uh, <laughs> although a lot of people were worried. Um, 
And uh, so she went to the White House. And back then, you could actually make an appointment to see the president, particularly if you were <coughs> Harry Peter Stone. And supposedly that's how he greeted her. It kind of sa sounds like him anyway, uh, although there's no absolute proof of it. Uh, at any rate, many, many people were sending similar things. And as a matter of fact, the very day that the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, January 1st, 1863, she was at a theater, and the theater just erupted with applause. And there were three cheers for Lincoln, three cheers for William Lloyd Garrison, and, and three cheers for Harry Beecher Stowe. And uh, she, she came to the balcony, and bonnet toppled off, and you know, her tears were streaming down her face. Um, because you know, they, the, the crowd realized how, how much she had done. So it's a great time to, to think about um, this wonderful novel. And uh, it appeared exactly uh, 160 years ago this March in book form. Previously, it had been running in installments for about a year in a Washington newspaper. But then, but then it came out in March 1852. And it was exactly 150 years ago this year. That was the first full year of the Civil War. So it's really a great time to to think about uh, the confluence of, of uh, both the, the anniversaries of the Civil War and, and Harry Beecher Stowe, and uh, as Mark mentioned, uh, 200 years ago, last June when she was born. So all these kind of uh, sesquicentennials and bicentennials are coming together. How could this little lady create such uh, an uproar? She was a diminutive woman, just five feet tall, dreamy-eyed, busy housewife with six children. She suffered from a number of real or imagined illnesses, <laughs> though she lived to the age of 85. Around the time that she wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, she described herself in a letter, I'm a little bit of a woman, somewhat more than 40, but as thin and dry as a pinch of snuff. <laughs> Never very much to look at in my best days. I think she was a little too self-critical. I, <laughs> I think she had a, a quite striking look to her. Uh, and looking like a used up article now, she said. <laughs> Uh, she lived, uh, she, was, she really was, was an incredibly modest person. She lived in a day when, when women had no political voice, they couldn't vote, that didn't come until 1920, and they were supposed to stay out of political discussions. If they lectured publicly, they were considered laughable at best, dangerous at worst. One father of the time wrote in a newspaper article that he would rather see his beloved daughter dead rather than see her speak in public. After Stowe became famous, she took a grand tour of uh, Europe in 1853, where crowds cheered her everywhere. But following the custom of the day, she didn't speak. She just sat and smiled and waited while her husband or her uh, brother got up and talked. Women's professional options were limited. And those who tried their hand at writing, as Stowe did, were faced with daunting challenges. After all, this was the era uh, that had produced some of our greatest male writers, Emerson, Melville, Hawthorne, Poe, Walt Whitman, just to name a few. There were a number of popular women writers, but when you think about some of these great works of, you know, Moby Dick, Scarlet Letter, The Raven, Leaves of Grass, all of them appeared within eight years of um, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And yet, Uncle Tom's Cabin had a far greater influence on society and politics than any of these works did. Stowe had an explanation for the effect of her novel. When, after Uncle Tom's Cabin had become such a hit, she heard a relative was worried she'd become vain about this. She just laughed and said he didn't have to worry about that because she didn't write Uncle Tom's Cabin. This comment provoked the amazed question, what? You didn't write that book? She said, no, God wrote it. It all came before me in a series of visions. And so she attributed the novel to divine inspiration. But what were the real life sources of the book? How did it become so influential? These are the kinds of questions I take up in my book, Mightier Than the Sword, Uncle Tom's Cabin, and the Battle for America. So. When we look at her early life, we recognize that many personal and cultural streams contributed to this earth-shaking novel. She had deep family roots that reached back to, to early New England, which may explain why I feel I can identify with her a little bit, because uh, you know, that's where my roots are as well. Her father was a leading Protestant clergyman, actually the leading clergyman of his day uh, in New England, uh, and really the first one to extensively link Christianity with social reform. He had started out in East Hampton, Long Island, where he spent a decade preaching among uh, Native Americans mainly, before moving to Litchfield, Connecticut, where Harriet Bourne was born on June 14, 1811. 
Lyman Beecher was the head of the so-called Benevolent Empire, a nationwide system of reform networks aimed at changing America for the better. Among his 13 children, by two wives, uh, his first wife passed away and he had four additional uh, children with his second wife. Among them was Henry Ward Beecher, um, the, uh, who became the most popular Protestant minister of 19th century America and carried on the anti, uh, carried on the reform tradition, although he was actually more anti-slavery than Lyman Beecher was more, a little more conservative on the slavery issue. Also, uh, let's see, Catherine, Catherine Beecher, the pioneer of education reform for women. Isabella Beecher Hooker, the suffragist, uh, and of course, most famous of all, Harry Beecher Stowe. When Harriet was in her 20s, she moved with her family to Cincinnati, Ohio, where her father became president of Lane Theological Seminary. Ohio was a border state where fugitive slaves were constantly coming over from Kentucky to seek freedom in the North. She was married to the theology professor Calvin Stowe, who shared her sympathy for fugitive slaves. Together, they became involved in the Underground Railroad, and once they helped send a fugitive slave woman to Canada with the help of friendly Northerners who became characters in Uncle Tom's Cabin. Calvin, her husband, was a brilliant man. He knew six languages, was considered really about the leading biblical scholar in, in the nation at that time. On the other hand, he had a meager professor's salary that because of the misfortunes of Lane Theological Seminary kept sinking. <laughs> so uh, at one point he was making $200 a year, which even then uh, the average worker would make maybe $480 a year, and a skilled worker would make about $800 a year. So, so even back then that, that, that wasn't really very much money. And so he encouraged um, Harriet to write magazine stories and articles uh, that brought in extra money, $35 here, $40 there, and, Pretty good money in those days. And it helped support their growing family. And all these writings appear long before Uncle Tom's Cabin, between 1833 and 1851, and then Uncle Tom's Cabin comes out in 1852. And if we look back in these earlier writings, we see the kind of uh, rich compost or soil from which Uncle Tom's Cabin came. Uh, three of the early tales attack slavery. Besides writing against slavery, she witnessed it once when she and a friend traveled to nearby Kentucky across the river and visited a plantation. This was her only direct exposure to slavery, but it made a lasting impression and provided several scenes for Uncle Tom's cabin. Her friend said that she just sat there quietly and kind of looked around her and sort of absorbed these scenes that become, uh, she recognized later in, in, in the novel. But the novel wouldn't have had such a huge impact if it didn't have other elements that made it appealing to the public. And uh, if we actually go back to those early stories and, and read them, we, we see all these, these elements, these tributaries that, that kind of flow into what became the river, the mighty <laughs> river of Uncle Tom's cabin. And uh, the popular writings of the day can be roughly divided between two types, the sensational and the sentimental. Sensational writings, usually published as pamphlet novels, were adventurous, exciting works that featured criminals, pirates, or other social outcasts involved in nefarious deeds that were often bloody or transgressive. Stowe wrote about this popular literature in her articles and letters. She thought it was immensely popular. She criticized it because it struck her as immoral, and yet <laughs> she was fascinated by it. And she confessed in a letter that she couldn't put down some of these racy books. She was also aware of a contrasting kind of popular literature, the sentimental, which was didactic and religious. Among her own early tales were stories about people who had visions of angels in heaven. And she and her husband took comfort in their own visions of spiritual beings, visions that were not at all unusual in that century, spirit, spirit wrappings, seances, and conversations with the dead. Seances were even held in the Lincoln White House, and William James, the most brilliant man of the century, would start a society uh, for the study of psychic phenomena and so forth. So yeah, it wasn't really that, that unusual. Uh, her early tales about angels directly anticipate Uncle Tom's Cabin, in which the blonde little Eva 
and the enslaved Uncle Tom had comforting visions of the other world. Another kind of fiction she wrote were temperance tales, which emphasized the virtues of sobriety and the savagery and crime that they believed came from drinking. In Uncle Tom's Cabin, the virtuous characters, mainly Northerners who help out fugitive slaves, are clean living types whose strongest drink is tea. <laughs> the pro-slavery pro char characters in the novel, in contrast, guzzle alcohol and are violent, despicable people. Particularly the slave owner, what's his name? Simon Legree, whose vicious, not everybody remembers that name, but if you've read the novel, uh, uh, you, you, know, you do a Simon Legree, whose vicious treatment of Tom and other slaves is fueled by his heavy drinking. So she was kind of writing all this temperance stuff and about you know, angels and, and so forth. She also wrote about sinless children. Uh, she had kind of a romantic, uh, Wordsworthian view and Bronson Alcott view of the, of the child. And uh, she accepted this, this view of children as innocent souls who were living examples of Christian love and also of a kind of democracy of, of reaching across uh, the religious divide and, and the racial divide as well. And the stories that she wrote on this topic led to the iconic character in Uncle Tom's Cabin, the dying Eva St. Clair, who sympathizes with slaves and who look, looks forward to a joyful afterlife. Stowe's other tales included ones in which she, she recreated Bible scenes in a deeply human way. And this personal engagement with the Bible lay behind the original vision that she said produced Uncle Tom's Cabin. She had come east in 1850 to Brunswick, Maine, because her husband had accepted a new job at Bowdoin College. And as she told the story, she was at a communion uh, service in a Brunswick church. And as she was thinking about Christ on the cross, she had a vision of an enslaved man being whipped to death under the direction of a white, white slave owner. And so she went home, and with this vision in her mind, she, she said, she wrote down the scene, which became the tragic climax of Uncle Tom's cabin. And then other scenes rushed into her mind. She started writing chapters that were published in installments, as I mentioned earlier, in the anti-slavery newspaper, The National Era. She became the first writer in American history to successfully combine the adventure, thrills, and blood of sensational fiction. Finally, she produced a kind of sensational fiction. There are a lot of sensational scenes here, including the, the, the bloody whipping of Uncle Tom and so forth. Combining that with images of, of, of angels, of heaven, of temperance, and the sinless child, and kind of fusing the sensational and sentimental in such a way that they swayed the emotions of millions of readers. And in the main, uh, also made a crystal clear social point. Slavery and the institutions behind it were evil. She aimed her novel directly at the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which imposed penalties on Northerners who helped runaway blacks. This pro-slavery law confirmed the clause of the Constitution that mandated the return of any person held to labor or service in one state who escapes into another must be returned. So in a sense, the Constitution at that time was viewed as a pro-slavery document. This is before the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, of course, before the Civil War. So um, Harry Beecher Stowe was the leading po uh, popularizer of, of what was called the, the higher law, held by those who looked beyond the Constitution as it then stood, or the Fugitive Slave Act, to the law of natural justice supported, they believed, Harry Beecher Stowe believed by God and morality, which the advocates, its advocates believed was higher than any, any human law. The ex-slave Frederick Douglass wrote of Uncle Tom's Cabin, we doubt if abler arguments have ever been presented in favor of the higher law that may, may be found here in Mrs. Stowe's truly great work. And Stowe had personal connections to advocates of the higher law before her novel had appeared, she had a long friendship with William H. Seward, the anti-slavery New York senator who, in a famous speech before Congress, uh, had declared that in considering slavery, America's, Americans must follow a higher law than the Constitution. Seward was really the one who popularized the phrase, the higher law. In the 1840s, before he even said that, he had served as a lawyer in a national legal case that originated in Ohio and involved Stowe's friend, John Van Zandt, the model for John Van Trump, a character in Uncle Tom's Cabin who helps uh, fugitive slaves. Van Zandt was a farmer and a conductor on the Underground Railroad. In the spring of 1843, right in the neighborhood where Harriet and Calvin Stowe lived near Cincinnati, Van Zandt encountered a family of nine runaway slaves, put them in his farm wagon, 
uh, with the aim of starting with the North on the Underground Railroad, but he was arrested for violating, violating previous fugitive slave law of 1793. And his case was, uh, he was arrested, taken to court, and his case went all the way to the Supreme Court, where he was defended by Seward by another close friend of Harry Beecher Stowe, Sam and Chase. Later, of course, Seward uh, was uh, Lincoln's Secretary of State, and Chase became the Secretary of Treasury. At any rate, in their argument before the Supreme, Supreme Court, uh, Chase and Seward turned the Van Zandt case into a lesson on a higher law. No legislature, Chase told the Supreme Court about slavery, can make right wrong or wrong right. No legislature can make men things or things men. And it's telling, I believe, that Stowe's original subtitle for Uncle Tom's Cabin was the ironic phrase, the man that was a thing. She was very much aware of this case. Uh, and she kind of had that on, on her mind when, when, when she uh, wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. And Chase also said, on questions which partake largely of a moral nature, the judgment even of this Supreme Court cannot be regarded as altogether final. This certainly would prove true of the Dred, Dred Scott decision and a few other decisions along the way. At any rate, the decision to be made here must necessarily be rejudged at the tribunal of public opinion. The opinion not just of the American people, but of the entire civilized world. Chase's appeal to the higher law failed to uh, persuade the Supreme Court. Van Zandt lost the case and he died a brokenhearted man and he was uh, fined $1,700, which was back then just an impossible amount of money. However, the case was not completely lost because Van Zandt and Chase had a determined friend in Harry Pichisto who put all future slave, slave laws on trial before the tribunal of the entire world in Uncle Tom's cabin, which became, as Seward declares, Van Zandt's greatest monument. Well, it was Van Zandt's greatest monument and also the monument to many other people, uh, white and black, that I discussed at some length in Money of the Sword, and Stowe incorporated their personal stories in there and produced this, this incredible work, Uncle Tom's Cabot. And she expertly wove together the, these real life stories with all those elements of popular culture that I discussed earlier. And it rang so many bells for readers that it, it just sold like wildfire. Her novel featured two compelling plots, the northern plot in which the fugitive slave Eliza Harris makes a daring escape with her baby in arms across the breaking ice of the Ohio River to the north where she reunites with her slave husband George Harris and both of them uh, finally they get off their way uh, with the Underground Railroad to Canada. This is based on a real life Eliza Harris who actually did escape across the ice and uh, Harry Beach still had learned this from an Ohio friend of her, John, John Rankin, who helped out Eliza Harris. But anyway, then there's the Southern plot in which the kindly Uncle Tom is tragically sold away from his wife and three children and ends up in the deep south under the command of the cruel master, Simon Legree, who orders the fatal whipping of Uncle Tom, who would rather die than tell Legree where two enslaved black women are hiding. The excitement of Over Uncle Tom's Cabin grew when it appeared in monthly installments, and then when it finally came out in book form in 1852, it shattered sales records and created an international sensation. The Boston preacher Theodore Parker declared, it has excited more attention than any book since the invention of printing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is the frontispiece of the first edition. In the first year, it sold over 310,000 copies in America and nearly 2 million copies abroad. Uh, which would be very, very good sales nowadays. <laughs> I mean, in, in, in any day, that would be a wonderful, wonderful sale. And the novel had far more readers than it did purchasers. Uh, because often Uncle Tom's Cabin, in a day before uh, TV and internet and all that, Uncle Tom's Cabin was the family entertainment. The family entertainment. It was read aloud to the whole uh, family. And this was a time when the average family had seven to nine children. Uh, so a lot, uh, it was estimated that 10 people read the novel or heard the book read aloud for every purchaser of the book. So, so really, there was kind of an exponential sort of, sort of thing at work here. For the first time, Northerners felt the horrors of slavery on the nerve endings. Many anti-slavery reformers jumped on the Uncle Tom juggernaut. Previously, the anti-slavery movement had been divided into small, sometimes conflicting groups that were widely unpopular. Uncle Tom's Cabin was a force for unity among these sometimes fragmented anti-slavery groups. The radical abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison, who had been hauled through the streets of Boston on a rope because he was so unpopular, 
He cried it when he read the novel, which he wrote would be, quote, eminently serviceable to the anti-slavery battle. Equally, equally receptive to the novel were anti-slavery uh, groups who were hostile to Garrison, such as the evangelical Tappanites. Stowe was overjoyed by the embrace of her novel by the different anti-slavery factions that she wrote. The fact that the wildest and extremist abolitionists, she's thinking of Garrison, have united with the coldest conservative anti-slavery people to welcome and advance my book is a thing I, I've never ceased to wonder at. And she was saying that not really bragging. She, she really wasn't. She, she, she was just, just really amazed that that had happened. Her novel helped create a more positive view of black people in society at that time. Most, most whites in that era saw blacks as subhuman or comically irresponsible, as seen as these images from minstrel shows, popular humor, and ethnographic science of the era. Um, these pictures more or less speak for themselves, and, but, but they also speak for the era in which, uh, which produced them. Harry Beecher Stowe in Uncle Tom's Cabin challenged such attitudes. In scene after scene, she showed the humanity of enslaved people. She made marital fidelity between enslaved blacks the driving force of her novel's two plots, The Escape to Canada, the slave couple of Eliza and George Harris, and the tragic separation of the enslaved Uncle Tom from his family. The impact of the novel was amplified by a powerful cultural phenomenon known as tomitudes. Representations of the novel in all popular medium, mediums, puzzles, card games, dolls, chinaware, and so forth. This phenomenon spread abroad. In London, you could buy Uncle Tom's Cabin shrinkable woolen stockings <laughs> and Uncle Tom's Cabin pure, unadulterated coffee. In Paris, restaurants offered menu items named after Uncle Tom characters. These are just a few examples of, of Tom and Toots. And what distinguishes uh, many of them from today's spin-off merchandise, Spider-Man t-shirts or Superman lunch boxes or whatever, Star Wars plastic toys and the like, is that many of the Tom and Toots had a distinctly political message. In most of this merchandise, blacks were not presented as caricatures or stereotypes. And a number of Uncle Tom's game, games, like the novel, invited players to sympathize with slaves, such as a very popular card game, whose goal was the reunion of slave families that have been disunited, have been separated. <coughs> there are a few more examples. Um, this, is a, this is a very popular doll. And there's a little, maybe a little caricature going on there. But, um, now, the most influential uh, Tom and Toots uh, tie-ins were plays based on, on the novel, the first of which appeared in 1852, just a few months after the publication of the novel. Far more people saw the play than read the novel. Pathos, thrills, music, impressive backdrops, all the crowd-pleasing elements were there in the play, which appeared throughout the North and everywhere made converts to the anti-slavery cause. The most surprising converts were Northern working class types who had previously been known for their violence against abolitionists, and sometimes, yes, against African Americans. It was unprecedented to see white working class people cheering for fugitive slaves, hissing at a cruel slave owner and weeping over the death of an enslaved man. Night after night, working class audiences applauded scenes that had a strong anti-slavery message. The novel had a role in the political reshuffling that lay behind the rise of the anti-slavery Republican Party. Back then, the Republican Party was really the liberal, <laughs> liberal party. Uh, the Democrats was, were increasingly uh, conservative and pro-slavery, and Republicans were based on anti-slavery. Anyway, uh, Stowe was often mentioned in political speeches like one on the House floor by her friend, the Ohio Congressman jo Joshua Giddings, who said, a lady with her pen has done more for the cause of freedom during the last year than any, any savant, statesman, or politician in the land. That inimitable work, Uncle Tom's Cabin, is now carrying the truth uh, carrying truth to the minds of millions who up to this time have been deaf to the uh, cries of the downtrodden. The novel changed many people's votes by melting their hearts. It was part of the explanation behind the success of two unlikely anti-slavery Republican candidates, John Fremont, who, John Fremont, who ran strongly in 1856, and Lincoln, who won in 1860. The one place <coughs> that the Uncle Tom's 
uh, epidemic was resisted was in, in the American South. Here's a Southern political cartoon showing the hellish chaos that um, the South believed would result if the anti-slavery principles behind Stowe's novel were put into effect in America. And it's kind of hard to see, but uh, Stowe's here by a cave leading to the depths of hell. The cave is called the Underground Railroad, and she's holding a book called Uncle Tom's Cabin, I Love Black People, which is, you know, and there a lot of sort of bad racial jokes going on here. And um, anyway, you can go through, on, on the right-hand side, she's being pulled by a bunch of devils, and she, that, that's her carriage in England, where she was feted and everything. And you, all, all kinds of kind of symbols going on there. But it's a Southern cartoon, and uh, many Southern states criminalized the sale of the novel. Mm -hmm. One man in the South was sentenced to jail for 10 years just for having the novel in his home. He escaped from jail after five years, and he went to Harry Beach Stowe's house, and she, he was an African-American, and he, uh, she helped him. Uh, she was living in, uh, in, in Hartford at the time. Now, uh, it also generated down south a very strong, huge new body of pro-slavery literature. Previously, very long defense of slavery were thought to be unnecessary. After all, Washington and Jefferson had owned slaves, and so most other presidents and politicians and Supreme Court justices, so it seemed a natural part of the, the American system. But Uncle Tom's cabinet impelled many Southern writers to promote slavery at great length. Almost 30 pro-slavery novels were written as direct replies to Uncle Tom's cabinet. These novels presented slavery as a wonderful institution that gave shelter, food, and religious instruction to people brought from Africa. But Harry Pinchas, though, optimistically hoped that people would be melted by her novels so they'd have a tremendous change of heart and recognize how evil slavery was. She also helped organize anti-slavery rallies and distribute uh, uh, petitions. She was ecstatic over the rise of Lincoln and the Republicans. But she was increasingly uncertain that either politics or persuasion were going to do away with slavery. The Kansas-Nebraska Act, which opened up the Western Territories for slavery, darkened her view. And her next anti-slavery novel, called Dread, which anticipated the name of the Dred Scott decision, which stripped uh, uh, black people of, of any rights. Anyway, Dread was gloomier than Uncle Tom's Cabin. Its hero is a militant fugitive slave who hides out in southern swamps and predicts a uh, violent judgment day for slaveholders. The novel uh, shows that Stowe, the creator of the gentle Uncle Tom, is now thinking of violence as a possible solution to the slavery problem. And for this reason, she, became to, she came to revere the anti-slavery warrior John Brown, who killed pro-slavery settlers in Kansas and then led a bold raid on Harper's Ferry, Virginia, in a heroic but doomed effort to liberate slaves there, after which he was captured, imprisoned, and hanged in 1859. Stowe's esteem for Brown matched that of two other former pacifists, Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson, who, believing that now, unfortunately, only bloodshed would end slavery, swayed Northern opinion by comparing Brown to the leaders of the American Revolution and even to Jesus Christ. Stowe chimed in by calling Brown a brave, good man who has done more for, than any other man yet for the honor of the American name. So she uh, really, really gained a huge respect for him. A journalist of the time uh, declared that Harry B. Stowe had spread anti-slavery kindling far and wide, and John Brown came along and lit it with the torch of violence. And there's some substance to the claim. Certainly, no other cultural figures polarized the nation to the degree that Stowe and Brown did. Small wonder that as the Union troops marched south during the Civil War, they sang the rhythmic words, John Brown's body lies moldering in a grave, but his soul is marching on. And it's understandable that just after the war, the author Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote a poem describing the ghosts of Uncle Tom and John Brown having marched through the war, spreading their anti-slavery influence everywhere, almost as ghosts. Indeed, Stowe's novel and Brown's actions taken together did more than anything else culturally to fuel the passions behind the war that ended the most egregious injustice uh, in, in American history. And both Stowe and Brown con continue to be presences in American culture right up to modern times. Brown remained a hero in the North for a while after the war, but then after the collapse of Reconstruction in 1876 and during the period that came after that, uh, the period of segregation known as Jim Crow, he came to be seen, seen as a mad fanatic, 
Only since the 60s, with the rise of civil rights, has his reputation been improving somewhat a little bit. As for Stowe, Uncle Tom's Cabin went in many directions. It was published eventually into 80, in 80 different languages. And it was a strong progressive influence uh, in many countries. 57 editions of the novel appeared in Russia, where it contributed to the emancipation of the serfs in 1861. It became, Len it became Lenin's favorite novel in childhood. It was the first American novel published in China in Chinese, and it helped fuel anti-slavery revolutions in Chile and Cuba. Meanwhile, it continued to be popular in America. In 1905, the New York Times reported that the two best-selling books in America were the Bible and Uncle Tom's Cabin. Just as important as the novel were many versions of the play. By the 1890s, there were hundreds of acting troops that fanned out across North America, putting on, putting on Uncle Tom's Cabin in every town, hamlet, and city. Many companies toured internationally, performing as far as away as India and Australia, and if you've seen the movie The King and I, uh, Siam. <laughs> uh, many versions of the play changed Stowe's hero, Uncle Tom, into a passive, obsequious old man. Now, this is not the way he is in the novel. In the novel, he's compassionate and loving and all that, but also very self-reliant. He's muscular. He saves, he's around 40 years old with three kids. He saves a, a white girl from drowning, and he remains very, very tough in the face of the sadistic cruelty of, of Simon McGree, who hates him exactly because he is so brave and unflinching. But too often on stage, when the play was adapted to the taste of the Jim Crow era, this was in the 1880s, 90s, and all the way up into the 20th century, he was falsely portrayed as an obedient, obedient fool, totally lacking in the virile, muscular quality of Stowe's original character. And this is mainly why, to this day, the term Uncle Tom is used to describe a weak-kneed person who kowtows to others, a cringing sycophant or a spineless sellout. But we shouldn't forget that in all the versions, the play didn't abandon Stowe's central point about the wickedness of slavery. For this reason, Uncle Tom's cabin still remained threatening in the South. And in 1906, uh, a series of laws were passed in the South called Uncle Tom's Laws, uh, preventing the performance of the play down South. And one Southerner, um, Thomas Dixon saw a play, Uncle Tom play, in 1901. He was so outraged uh, by it that he launched an all-out attack on the novel, which he considered a hateful work that had destroyed the good old plantation South. Dixon wrote bitterly, Uncle Tom's cabin caused the Civil War, killed a million men, desolated and ruined the South, and changed the history of the world for the worst. He, res he responded to Uncle Tom's cabin by writing pro-slavery novels that adopted the names of Stowe's characters, Shelby and Tom and this and that, and George Harrison, but pointed them in the exact opposite direction by advocating the punitive lynching of black people, the justified, supposedly justified punitive lynching of black people. And one of his bestsellers, The Klansman, was the basis of D.W. Griffith's landmark, a deputy made yet thematically abhorrent film the Birth of a Nation, which made heroes of the Ku Klux Klan, as in this scene here. The movie not only became the most, the most popular film of the silent era, but also caused the real-life resurgence of the KKK. Then in the 1930s came the most popular movie of all time, Gone with the Wind, the romantic uh, epic of the Old South, based on the novel by the Atlanta author Margaret Mitchell, who said she wrote Gone with the Wind in part to counteract what she saw as the anti-Southern message of Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. Even as these pro-Southern films were supporting Jim Crow, Uncle Tom's Cabin was making its own mark in the film industry. No, no less than nine silent films based on Stowe's novel appeared between 1909 and 1927. Like the novel, these uh, films portrayed enslaved black people compassionately. For example, all the Uncle Tom films de depict the lead character, Tom, as a dignified and sympathetic figure, and this is particularly true of the 1927 epic film, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which cost a then astounding $2 million to make and which featured a wonderful performance by James B. Lowe in the role of Uncle Tom. I was uh, able to upload that recently on YouTube, so you can actually watch it. Uh, and it's a really, really uh, well-done well film for, for its era. And so there was a massive Hollywood duel going on. 
between pro-Tom and anti-Tom films. And a similar, similar duel was occurring among American historians. One group, the so-called Dunning Group, named after the Columbia professor William Archibald Dunning, said that the Civil War, caused by fanatics like Harry Beecher Stowe and John Brown, um, resulted in Reconstruction, which these historians call a tragic time when newly emancipated uh, blacks proved to be poor political leaders and predators who targeted white women. This is kind of a Dunning view of history. But there was another group of historians, led by W.E.B. Du Bois, who had a more accurate view, as we see it today, of the American past. For this group, the Civil War was emphatically a change for the better, since it resulted in emancipation. From, from this vantage point, both Stowe and Brown were heroes. Du Bois wrote a laudatory biography of John Brown, and he said of Stowe, thus to a frail, overburdened Yankee woman, with a steadfast moral purpose, we Americans, black and white, owe gratitude for the freedom and union, union that exist in the United States of America. Now today, this more positive view of the Civil War and Reconstruction is widely accepted, and it's a good moment for us to recognize the importance of, of Harry Beecher Stowe in our novel. After all, during the Civil Rights era, it was those who acts of protest most closely resembled that of Uncle Tom. Stowe's Tom, the Tom of the novel, not the sheepish one of popular myth, that proved to be the most effective in promoting progress. Rosa Parks, the quiet woman who refused to give up her bus seat in Montgomery, didn't mind the Uncle Tom label, since she believed that great change could result from nonviolent moral protest. Another pacifist, Martin Luther King, though often called Uncle Tom by militant, uh, his militant opponents, also stuck to principle nonviolence and moved millions by telling America about a dream of a more egalitarian nation. These Uncle Tom like figures proved to be among the most powerful forces for social change in America. It's time we do justice to Harry Beecher Stowe by correcting our understanding of Uncle, Uncle Tom and, other great and uh, the other great characters in the novel. A good place to begin is the source, Uncle Tom's Cabin itself. For those who want to read or reread the novel, <laughs> I would like to recommend my new edition, uh, a facsimile, the so-called splendid edition. Uh, it was really the second edition. It came out as, as a gift book in late 1852 at the time, uh, cost an astounding amount of money. Um, but I was able to produce a uh, facsimile edition of it. And, uh, has 117 marvelous illustrations, which are not, not caricatured whatsoever uh, by Hamid Billings, who was just a terrific illustrator. And he did Shakespeare and Hawthorne and everybody else, but he, he did, it was just great. Uh, and uh, perhaps, and, and you know, read the novel itself, because it, it's, it's really a wonderful read. Maybe some of you saw Nicholas Kristof's a list of great works, classic works that you have to read. Uh, this was last summer, and he listed several books, Mark Twain and Emily Bronte and Sir Victor Hugo. Second on the list was Uncle Tom's Cabin. And he called it a profoundly moving read, a real tear jerker, a powerful and illuminating exploration of the human dimensions of slavery. And I, I love the way he wrote that. Christophe's writing said an Uncle Tom's Cabin can be a tear jerker. When, his first pub, when it first came out, a reviewer said, reviewer said, the human being who can read this book with dry eyes is commended to Barnum. That means Barnum's Museum, this, this museum of, of, of oddities and so forth. Um, I have to admit that even though I taught the novel in university classes for over three decades, I never shed a tear over it until I was actually writing my current book, My Newton Sword. While working on the book, I saw for the first time just how much personal material and anguish Stowe endured as she wrote, wrote about slavery and how also a positive, really, her, novel, her novel's influence has been over time as a force for liberation in, in, in so many different ways. And it really made me kind of appreciate uh, the novel a lot more than I had. And, and, and so I see really my book as kind of a companion uh, to the novel. And, and I must say that reading, uh, writing this book made me appreciate not only the emotions and not only the impact, but also the artistry of the novel. The sharpness of her characterization is extraordinary, as it is her narrative drive, her use of vernacular language, her subtly described scenes, which come alive in the mind, like realistic pictures. In 1868, the novelist John W. DeForest coined the term the great American novel to describe Uncle Tom's Cabin. He found it greater uh, than fiction by Hawthorne and by anybody else. Tolstoy called Stowe's novel an example of the very highest art on a level with Shakespeare. Now, I don't know if we can go that far, but certainly if you haven't read Uncle Tom's Cabin lately, give yourself a real treat and do so. 
believe me, you'll be very happy you did. Thank you. Yes. Uh, tell us about the movement to relocate blacks back to Africa after, after the Well, that, that was a movement called colonization. Colonization, the idea that you could uh, emancipate blacks or take free African Americans in the North and, and send them back to Africa, called colonization. And the American Colonization Society was founded in 1817. Became very, very popular. Lyman Beecher, her father, was colonizationist. And at the end of Uncle Tom's Cabin, still actually has George Harris thinking, thinking about going back to Africa and so forth. So that was a little bit controversial. However, we have to remember that Abraham Lincoln had this dream until the second year of the Civil War. He was a pretty ardent colonizationist. Uh, Andrew Jackson, Thomas Jefferson, Henry Thoreau. There were a lot, lot, lots and lots of people. Henry Clay, I mean, you could go on and on and on. Not much ever came of it. Only 15,000 or so uh, of African Americans were actually sent back to, to Africa. But it was a very, very popular idea. And at the time, might have contributed actually to the popularity of the novel. I don't know. It, it could have, because it was a slightly conservative ending in the time it was a very, very popular idea. So, yeah. Uh, you mentioned the plays. Uh, were the black characters played by black actors? Well, until 1878, all the black characters were played by white people in blackface. But then um, Sam Lucas in 1878, who was a wonderful African-American performer, uh, played Uncle Tom. And Harriet Beecher Stowe really, really praised uh, uh, this, this, this event. And she prayed, uh, she, placed, uh, she praised um, the Fisk family singers who sang African American spirituals. And then Sam Lee, uh, Lucas became the first African American to assume a lead role in a film in 1914 in the Uncle Tom. Just before he died, he played Uncle Tom. And he did a wonderful job in the 1914 silent film. So uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin had a, a very important effect in, in African American performance. So it changed the. Yeah, it changed, although I, I will say that even after that, a lot of them were in blackface. A lot, a lot, a lot of the people that performed were still in blackface. But it did, it did change increasingly toward African-American involvement. Yeah, absolutely. Yes? Which came first, um, or her brother Henry? That is, what was their influence on each other? Um, oh, I see, what was their influence? I think, you know, Henry really came out strongly against slavery before Harriet did. I would have to credit Henry as being, in a way, the pioneer within the family. I really would. He came out in 1847 very, very strongly uh, in the Brooklyn pulpit and so forth. And I, I would really have to credit Henry Ward Beecher as being the first really ardent anti-slavery spokesman in the family. Yeah. But then, ultimately, her impact on a worldwide wide basis was, was stronger. Yeah. I'm just curious, one playwright wrote the play that was then disseminated for all Well, years. Uh, a fellow named George Aiken, A-I-K-E-N, yeah, and actually that play was played down in the village at the Metropolitan Playhouse last, last uh, December, and they did a wonderful job there. But uh, that was the most popular play. There were many other variations of the play. There was another play uh, uh, that was a little more pro-slavery. There, there, there were kind of pro-Southern versions of it as well by a guy named Howard. So, and then uh, there are all kinds of variations on this play. But ultimately, it became just very, very, it became so popular, so just incredibly popular. So much so that the audiences knew the lines just as well as the actors. You know, really, they, they would go, they, they, they knew all the lines, though. Everybody in the audience knew, knew everything. And yet they went back time after time after time to, to, to see this. So, yeah. How long after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed did it take for uh, slavery to die out? Well, uh, you know, the, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, that, that Emancipation Proclamation uh, came out in January 1st, 1863. And then uh, there was a constitutional uh, amendment, uh, the 13, 14, 15, within the next, uh, the Civil War ends you know, in, in 1865. So uh, the Emancipation Proclamation was just the first and then over uh, of, of several things that happened that ended slavery. Um, so, you know. Um, but it took quite a few years. No, no, no. No, no, not at all, no. It was. 
it was, uh, you know, uh, well, you know within, within a couple of years, uh, slavery was gone. And uh, the Civil War was over in 1865, so. Uh, in the early people days. still kept slaves illegally. Yeah, illegally. And a lot of people would argue that slavery never really died out, died out totally in certain sections of the South because you had a kind of de facto slavery during, even during Reconstruction and even during Jim Crow and so forth. So uh, there was kind of second slavery, so to speak, even though it wasn't called slavery. So, yeah. Pardon me? Ten farmers. Ten farmers, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes? Yeah, I find it hard to account for the persistence of Tom as obsequious in more recent times. I didn't even know there had been any plays and it began to come out in the civil rights era. How did that stay in the public consciousness? Well, during the 1960s, it was used as a weapon by yeah. militant reformers, and even by people like Muhammad Ali, then Cassius Clay, who we call his opponents, oh, he's just Uncle Tom and everything. It became circulating in popular culture back then during the 60s, and it kind of stuck, so to speak. But yeah, I mean, today, I mean, uh, who was it who called Obama an Uncle Tom? And someone's called Condoleezza Rice an Uncle Tom and so forth. I mean, and uh, Powell has been called an Uncle Tom. But I mean, the phrase, in a way, sort of rings hollow a little, a little bit today, it seems to me. It really does, even though it has a kind of circulation of some people still use, use the term in that way. Yeah. I think the central thing was that Tom is a martyr, and the blacks of the 50s and 60s were rejecting martyrdom and yes. they were actively fighting and living yes, to yes, results. Yes, And so the phrase became a kind of weapon, yeah. become a, 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 a weapon of, of disparagement. People who just kind of sat back and, and sort of just nonviolent protests and so forth. Uh, there were a lot, of, a lot of reformers back in the 60s in particular who really wanted a more militant, <coughs> militant posture, much more militant posture. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the genesis of the Ku Klux Klan? Well, um, yeah, it, it arose uh, in 1867 and then spread, uh, but then it was suppressed in the 1870s, in the 1870s. But then uh, the, the movie that I showed, uh, Birth of a Nation, 1915, really caused, caused a resurgence, rediscovery, a uh, re-life of the Ku Klux Klan, and then became really, really powerful during the 1920s in particular, but also uh, even in the decades after that. And especially in the Midwest, not, yes. not primarily in the South. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yes, yeah. yeah. So uh, there's incredible, this whole kind of cycle of events. Yeah. Uh, for people who haven't read other works by Stowe, are there others that you recommend? Well, she wrote 30 novels about 30 novels. <laughs> If you can imagine doing that with six kids. And she also endured a lot of personal setbacks and tragedies and everything like that. So you know, she's incredible. Uh, Minister's Wooing is wonderful. Dread is wonderful. Paganak People is just great. I mean, I, I, I just love it. like Heritage Stowe so much. But I, you know, I, I teach these novels all the time. Old Town Folks is absolutely wonderful. Some of her short stories, you know, I love them. Yeah. Is that an apocryphal story about her meeting Lincoln and saying that? Well, we're supposed to call it apocryphal. We know that she did have that meeting in November 1862 with Lincoln in the White House, and there was a lot of joking around. I wouldn't be surprised if he said it. However, the story didn't surface until 1896. She had met him in 1862, and her son said, well, Lincoln said this. So, you know, we're supposed to say it's apocryphal, to be sure. Yeah. What? How did, um, how about the finances here? Did she profit from all of this? Well, in, um, she, she would have made a lot, of, a lot of money, but she was quite poor before she wrote the novel, and she couldn't negotiate a very good contract. Her publisher said, I'll give you half the profits if you contribute to the advertising. She said, I can't afford it, so she took 10% instead of half the profits. Wow. And so she made $30,000, which was a lot of money back then, but still, you know. And she didn't, uh, also, her book was ripped off. They, uh, there was no copyright protection, international copyright, so it was just pirated left and right, and sold in millions and millions. She didn't make a penny from a lot of the, a lot of sales, and she didn't make a penny from any of the plays or any, any of the spin-offs or anything like that. So, but you know, she never never really complained about that. Never really complained. 
Yes. It's a trivial question. What language was the first translation in? Uh, it was in, uh, I know in French, there are many editions in, in French, but I think yeah. French and then German, very quickly, French and German and Italian. There was even a Roman Catholic edition of the novel about the Immaculate Conception and all of that, which it's interesting, it was kind of changed. And in, in Russia, none of the plays had any reference to religion because uh, particularly later on, uh, you know, uh, even later on when, during communism and so forth, because uh, they didn't want any reference to religion. So it was changed uh, uh, quite well. There was a strong political message in the, in the French, where, at least in the French readership of the book from the beginning. Yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. It's very, very popular in France. Wow. Is that being praised or studied in any way? Uh, it should be studied a lot, much more. The international repercussions, I mean, there, have, there has been one book on it, but there, there should be many, many more books on it. Many books on it, you know. That's really it, it's a great topic for anybody who ever wants to, you know, to take it up, really. It's a wonderful, wonderful topic. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, I can't read too many languages myself, but <laughs> uh, American Antiquarian Society just received a collection of all, virtually all the foreign translations. Mm -hmm. And uh, it must be wonderful just to sit there and, and look at these books, just as artifacts, if nothing else, you know. Yeah? Did the Beechers ever own slaves? No, no, they, 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 they never owned slaves, no. They went back to... Oh, that, uh, back, not that, not that I know of, no. Unlike Walt Whitman, whose grandparents, they lived on Long Island, and it was, you know, there was slavery in New York until 1828. Slavery was permitted in New York until 1828, so Walt Whitman's grandparents uh, had slaves and so forth. But not, not to my knowledge, no. They came from a, a Puritan tradition that was really pretty anti-slavery. Anyway. Yes? What's your take on why she entitled it Uncle Tom's Cabin and not some other word? I think she was trying to get us inside the domestic circle of these enslaved people. She was trying to get us right in the home and showed that there were real human beings with real feelings, with wives, with kids, and all that. So I, you know, and there are these scenes early on in the cabin and, and, and so forth. So I think I think she really wanted to, to, to make the, the middle class readers of her day feel that the slaves were, were human beings. They weren't just beasts who could be whipped and sold and chained and just torn apart and sexually exploited and all of that. They were real human beings, you know. So yes. Now the subtitle. Life Among the Lowly. Was that her choice, or the publisher? Did she come up with that? Uh, she, she, she did, and the reason she did is that she believed she had sympathy for oppressed white people as well as oppressed black people, and also for Native Americans so, and so forth. She wanted to make, and at several points in the novel, she stops and she says, this is part of a larger uh, revolution, a larger issue of the working classes, the working classes. Her husband uh, probably read Karl Marx. He read German very, very, uh, very, very well. And Karl Marx's books were, were appearing. So um, there's kind of that element there, uh, which is one reason why it appealed uh, in, in, in Russia and in China as well, because it had this kind of subversive edge to it. It was really for, for the lowly, the, the oppressed, the oppressed. Yeah. Did other siblings get into the uh, movement? Well, six of her brothers were clergymen. And Henry, Henry Ward Beecher was a leading, leading anti-slavery minister, and all of them were in anti-slavery, all of them. And some of the sisters were uh, too. Isabella uh, not only became a leading feminist, but she was also a leading uh, abolitionist as well. She, she participated in the anti-slavery movement as well. So uh, they, they, they were all reformers. They were all really thinking about society. And she wasn't really thinking too much about the money. That's why you, know, you read her letters, letter after letter, she's not saying, Oh, I'm making such a big hit, and everybody's, uh, you know, everybody's reading my book. Isn't this great? She's thinking about enslaved people, you know, she, and she's thinking about the the effect that that her book has on society. That that's what really counted to her. So uh, there's a certain genuineness that I think comes through when you read the novel too. I really do. It's, it's, it's incredible that way. So uh, yeah. So you're teaching students today with all their other distractions and interests, which you find that it resonates with them too. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very much. This is a book that actually can be read, I think, by let's say a tenth grader or eleventh grader. I happen to teach more advanced students at this point, but, but yeah, I, you know, it, it can be read. A lot of children 
were read this novel aloud. And you know, it can be understood by, by children as well as adults. And I think some of the greatest writing, like Poe's short stories, can be read by seventh grade. I used to teach seventh grade, and I used to teach at Brown Hall. I, I really believe that this, this book can be apprehended by, by people of all ages. Anyway, thank you very much for having me. Again, that Dr. Reynolds is available to sign copies of his book, and that he'll, of course, be uh, willing to chat with you as well. I will ask him to be at the front of the building, so just come to the front. And thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you.